Uh, in this video, I wanted to show you this new 24 volt DIY solar generator that I built. It has a 4,000 watt inverter with a built-in battery charger and 10 kilowatt hour battery storage. Uh, this Sun Gold Power inverter charger is the star of the show and it has some amazing features and you won't believe the surge capacity. So be sure to stick around to the end and I'll show you all about it. And also I'm going to do a stress test and see if I can bring this up to the max capacity and see how it handles it. Please consider subscribing to the channel. I'll be doing many more videos coming up on preparedness and self-sustainability. And also, if you, if you do end up subscribing, put a comment down below that you subscribed. I, I like to try to, I, I try to reply to all the comments that people make. Why am I moving from a 12 volt to a 24 volt system? Well, there's a few reasons. Uh, one reason is that 2000 watts just wasn't enough. And I wanted to move up to a 4000 watt inverter because I've occasionally run over that 2000 and the, the inverter would trip and it would turn everything off and it could be very irritating depending on what you're doing at the time. So if I wanted to move up to a 4000 watt inverter, if I left it at 12 volts, then all my wire sizes would be wrong. I'd have to, I'd have to reevaluate all the wire sizes and this main wire running between the inverter and the battery system would have to be doubled in size and, and more expensive. So I wanted to stick with a smaller wire size. Some of you may be thinking, why not just go straight to a 48 volt system? And I could have, I thought about it carefully, but one of the, probably the primary reason I didn't is I've been doing this for several months and I've learned a great deal, but I still haven't got a lot of experience under my belt with DIY solar generators because in 48 volts can kill you. Anything, anything over 30 is considered dangerous. So I wanted to stick with 24 volts for a while and uh, get some good experience under my belt and then I'll move up to 48 volts. This 24 volt system was going to take up more of a footprint than the 12 volt system. So I measured the area carefully where I wanted to uh, mount it and I cut a piece of three quarter inch plywood to mount everything on. I, I took quite a bit of time deciding on the layout. I laid out all the pieces and thought through it very carefully before I mounted anything. One thing I learned in the 12 volt build was that it makes more sense to lay out all your components, measure and make your wires first, then connect everything temporarily before marking the drill holes and mounting everything. Uh, what the reason for this is that you think you measure everything carefully enough after you've mounted everything for the wires and then you make your wire and it will be just, you know, a tenth of an inch short or something and it won't go on. And it, it's real frustrating. Then you have to, you have to take a dis disconnect it, re-drill holes, and then connect it again. So all that frustration can be avoided if you just carefully lay everything out, make your wires, temporarily connect them, and then do your drill holes. As you can see here, I decided to go with two MPPT solar charge controllers. For those of you wondering, yes, you can do this. You can have multiple charge controllers. It works fine. I'm sure there'll be some tweaking on the settings as I move forward and learn more about how they're charging the system. The main reason I went with two charge controllers is because I have two solar arrays in two completely separate parts of my property. This also provides redundancy if one of the charge controllers stop working. I can at least have one working and be charging the system. This is a Bourgeois V 40 amp MPPT solar charge controller. I have 800 watts on my DIY mobile solar array, which I did a video on. I'll put a link below. I may eventually replace this Bourgeois V charge controller and replace it with a Victron. The Victrons can actually talk to each other and I really like the Victron mobile app interface. I would probably get a 150 volt 50 amp Victron charge controller to replace it with. This is the Victron 100 volt 30 amp MPPT solar charge controller. It currently has up to 600 watts coming into it. Uh, I have just these three panels on the left leaning up against the fence until I build something to mount them on. I'll be doing a video upcoming on that. This charge controller can only support up to 100 volts, so I can only add one more panel there if I stick with these same panels that I'm currently using. But I can add about three more panels to the Bouger V solar charge controller. I'm actually under paneled right now. Uh, as I can, over the next few months, I'm going to expand the solar panels to where I have enough for the to, for this system. I decided to use this distribution box to hold the PV input breakers. It's not required. I just thought it looked nicer. Uh, I, inside I have two 20 amp breakers. Uh, this, they're actually there to protect the system in case more the, something happens to the panels and they go over 20 uh, amps. I may get a third solar charge controller at some point. Um, the reason for this is that I have two Blue Eddy 350 watt solar panels that are portable and they, 
they, they can be easily deployed if I'm running low of battery power. And I just want to I just want to add some extra power to, to get the batteries charged up if it's sunny and nice out. I've decided if I'm going to do this yet or not, but uh, I'll do a video if I do do that. The output from the solar charge controllers run into this distribution box. In this distribution box, I have a 32 amp breaker for the for the Victron, which is a 30 amp, and then the one on the right is a 40 amp breaker for the Bujar V40 amp solar charge controller. The output from this distribution box comes down to these bus bars. There's the negative bus bar and the positive bus bar. These are Pike Industries bus bars. They are tin coated solid copper bus bars. The bus bars are rated up to 400 amps. This is the battery disconnect switch where it's, I can quickly shut down the power to and from the battery if I need to. This thing is rated up to 275 amps with uh, surge capacity up to like 455. Before I move on, I'm going to show you this little piece of paper I stuck here on the refrigerator next to the system. I put this for my family so they know how to shut these things down. It kind of shows the steps involved to do that. If something's happening, I'm not here. They can quickly come in here and take a look at this and follow these instructions. This Blue C ANL 250 amp um, fuse and fuse holder are, is high quality. Uh, much better quality than what I was using previously. Um, but if I do move up to 48 volt, I will have to replace this because um, these ANL fuses are only good up to, I think, 30 volt systems. So if, I move, if you went to a 36 or a 48, uh, then you would have to go up to probably a class, I'm sorry, a uh, yeah, class T fuse or a mega fuse. Off the negative wire from the negative bus bar is a Victron smart shunt. This Victron Smart Chunt is actually Bluetooth capable, so it has a really nice mobile app, as I mentioned earlier, and it's really good for that. It shows history and everything, but the bad side is I can't just stand here and look at it and see the state of charge on my battery bank. Uh, there is other equipment I can buy, uh, Victron, expensive stuff, but it'd be nice to mount it here, and I can actually see state of charge, how my solar Victron solar charge controller is doing. Uh, I'll be looking into that in the future. I'm going to move down to something that you don't typically see in a lot of videos now, but I have here a bus bars for my battery bank. So each battery connects to these bus bars, and then I just have one wire coming off the bus bar to the rest of the system towards the inverter. These two bus bars are nickel plated, and they have three studs, and they are rated up to 600 amps. Oh, and it's a solid copper bus bar. And we'll talk about the batteries. These two batteries are Power Queen 24 volt, 200 amp hour batteries. They each have a 200 amp BMS built in. Putting these batteries together like this in parallel gives me a total of 24 volt, 400 amp hour, or 10,240 watt hours. These two batteries are the equivalent of eight 12 volt, 100 amp hour batteries. These things weigh 80 pounds each. Uh, I built this table to hold the batteries as well as hold my Blue Eddy AC200 Max underneath, so that table is holding quite a bit of weight. One nice thing about these two 24 volt batteries is if I decide to move to a 48 volt system, as I think I mentioned earlier, but I can wire these in series and have 48 volt battery bank. These two wires are actually six gauge wires. At first I thought that was small, but the Power Queen manual actually says this is the size to use to wire the batteries together. The wires coming off of each battery going to the bus bars is actually a four gauge wire and then coming of course coming off the bus bars is one alt going to the rest of the system and the inverter. It's very important when wiring your batteries together like this and the wires going to the bus bars <coughs> are the same size and length exactly and it helps uh, keep things equalized uh, over time that your batteries could become unequalized. These batteries have a five-year warranty and are rated to 100 percent depth of discharge after 4,000 cycles. That means if you charge these batteries down to zero and recharge them fully every day over 10 years, they won't lose any of their charging capability. After, after 20 years, they only go down to 80% of their depth of discharge. That's just crazy to me. I will most likely at some point move to a, a new better, better technology before these batteries even come close to wearing out. Before I hooked up these batteries to the systems, I followed the instructions in the Power Queen manual to equalize the batteries. 
basically the steps is to charge each battery separately, which I did with the Sungo Power inverter charger, to full. And then I connect the batteries together in parallel using the six uh, gauge wires I showed, then leave them alone with nothing else connected between 12 and 24 hours so they can equalize. Then you can connect up your battery bank and move forward connecting it to the system. Uh, Power Queen recommends you do this every six months. White wire that's running from the inverter down to the back of the batteries, it's just taped to the back of the batteries. It's a temperature sensor. And it's a feature of the inverter that it can shut down the inverter if the battery starts overheating. And the, as I mentioned, the wire running from the battery bank all the way to the inverter, negative and positive, both, it's all one out wire. And I'd run my calculations and the one out wire came up to be big enough because it supports, the Windy Nation one out wire actually supports up to, I think it was 100, no, I'm sorry, 285 amps. And actually the manual for the inverter said to use one out wire, so that's, that's what I went with. Now we've come to the inverter plus charger. This thing is a beast. It weighs 54 pounds. And this is the uh, single phase uh, model, not the split phase. They do make that model also. This inverter is what they call a low frequency inverter. Uh, you mostly see high frequency inverters, not low frequencies. Um, most DIY wires that you see, they don't even mention that, and it doesn't even say sometimes in the product documentation. But most of them are high frequency inverters. Low frequency inverter actually has some uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, the advantage is that it can handle huge surges for up to 20 seconds. This inverter is a 4,000 watt inverter, so you would think, what, 8,000 watts uh, surge? No. This inverter can actually handle up to 12,000 watts for up to 20 seconds. It does this by having a huge transformer inside. So that transformer is why this thing weighs so much more than other types of inverters. Uh, low frequency inverters are supposed to be more reliable. They're supposed to run a little cooler. Uh, there are some downsides though. As I mentioned, low frequency inverters are heavy. Uh, they also have, typically have a higher idle consumption. Um, when I disconnect everything and only have this inverter running, nothing else connected to it, I even turned off the solar charge controllers, the battery sunt shows it's drawing 59 to 60 watts, just sitting there with no load. That's definitely on the high side. So because of this, you would probably need a little extra battery capacity and solar panel capacity to make up for that. This inverter has a UPS feature. It switches between uh, AC input and battery in less than 10 milliseconds. Let's have power saver mode. And what this does is it kind of puts the inverter to sleep and it checks for a load on the system every 30 seconds. I believe it was 30 seconds. And when it detects the load, it will kick on the inverter and power. And this saves quite a bit of uh, idle consumption. I think I read it maybe down to 20 or 25 watts. Uh, so you can configure that to check every three seconds though. So that's a setting over here on these dip switches on the side. This is where everything is configured on this. There's no Bluetooth capability. Everything's configured with these little dip switches here. And I had these Power Queen lithium iron phosphate batteries. And so you can set the type of battery you have with here with this little dial. But when I was reading the manual, Power Queen manual, at how, at how it wanted to be charged and you know the voltages and things and when I looked into the manual of this inverter charger uh, actually the lithium slash sealed adolescent setting uh, matched better those parameters I found in the power queen manual so I emailed Sungold and they replied back and said yes you can use that setting for lithium iron phosphate batteries so that's what I'm using in my specific case with these specific batteries one of the things I like about this unit is that, it, as I mentioned, it has a charger built in. It's actually configurable here. You can choose your type of battery here with this setting, this little dial right here. And you can configure how much amps the charger charges the battery. You can configure it between 0 and 50 amps. As I mentioned, uh, these little dip switches here is how you configure it. Switch number five is allows you to switch between battery priority or AC priority 
mode. Uh, there's actually an AC input I'll, I'll cover in just a minute on the other side, and you can have the AC input coming in. If you're in AC priority mode, it uses the AC input all the time, and it only uses the battery and inverter as a backup source. Battery priority mode, it's the exact opposite. It uses the battery and the inverter all the time. Now there is an exception to this. There is a there is a voltage setting to, that, in, that you can actually configure between two voltages with one of the switches. And if, if the voltage in the battery bank gets down to a certain level, it will actually switch over to AC priority mode for just a moment and charge the batteries all the way to full and then switch back to battery priority mode. And as I mentioned, this has a um, UPS feature. So as it's doing the switching between AC input and battery, it's less than 10 milliseconds and you'll never even notice that it's doing that. This is the temperature sensor I showed earlier. And then this actually is a generator start feature that you can uh, automatically start a generator if you and have it plugged into the AC input on the other side and it will uh, you can use generator power instead of AC uh, grid power. The three terminals at the bottom are for AC input and the three top are AC output. And if you remember what I said a minute ago about battery priority mode. If it gets down to 21 volts, that's the setting I've got it set at, if it gets below that it'll it'll switch over to AC input and quit using the battery. And while it does this, it powers all the loads and charges the batteries through this one wire right here coming in on the bottom. That's really important to pay attention to because you're not only could you be powering up to 4,000 4, watts of load, but you're also charging the battery. So this much AC input is not, you, you can't do this with a typical outlet. Uh, typical outlets only, you know, are 15 amp or 20 amp, and they're not designed for that much wattage. Uh, this actually, will, this actually has a breaker here, it goes up to 40 amps. So what I had to do was hire an electrician to put a new 40 amp single pole breaker in my breaker box, and he ran over this eight gauge wire here and coming through the back. I didn't want to do that, but that I did in this case. So so that this wire is rated up to 40 amps so that makes this wire safe to, to handle that much capacity. Also I'm using an 8 gauge wire come on the output coming up to this outlet here that runs over to my uh, transfer switch. As I mentioned instead of this wire coming from my breaker panel I could also run a wire here from my generator but at this point I don't have a generator that big enough to handle that kind of load so I'm just going to use AC input now I'd have to take this wire out and change in the new wire if I wanted to do that. It's kind of a pain. So if I did want to move to that, I'll probably end up uh, rigging some kind of uh, outlet or something here where I can just easily switch between AC input and my generator. It's my goal that this wire is never used. I want to keep the batteries powered up enough to power all the loads I want to power uh, and never use this. So my goal is to actually never use that wire. Uh, so uh, but just in case it, uh, it does get down to a low enough voltage, it will kick in and, and uh, charge the battery up. Now, there are these two outlets here that I could use. I, I have used them, but mostly I'm just using the output from the hardwire terminals that go up to this uh, outlet here, which is a, a NEMA L1430R 30 amp outlet. It's the twist style that locks in. And this wire, I, I have it running up and over to my uh, manual uh, power transfer switch. The inverter charger also comes with this little display panel you can you can mount remotely and it has I think the same thing that's on here or maybe just a little bit more uh, text is is all it has and you you would just plug this plug this into that port right there to uh, mount this somewhere else if you wanted to to do that. It, probably most appropriate to use something like that in a in an RV. I'm going to put this through a small stress test and check for heat and make sure it performs okay. Uh, I don't want to push it to 12,000 watts. I don't even think I could do that anyway. But uh, I'm going to push it a little over 4,000, see how it runs, and uh, check for heat levels, make sure everything's okay. Turn it on the air fryer. Turning on the toaster oven. Okay, with, with the air fryer and toaster oven running, to toaster oven, I am running 40%. I'll turn on the oil heater. I 
And I'm now pushing seventy eight seventy percent. Now let's try the heat gun. I'm low. And we're running eighty to ninety eighty nine to ninety percent of four over the four thousand watts. So if I push it to high We are now 96%. Let me turn the heat up a little. Hundred and twelve, hundred and ten percent. Let's dial it back down. We got we did get an overload trip signal pop up there and turn this back down okay what it dropped below 100 percent and the overload light went off so we are now pushing 87 percent let me turn it back up we'll wait for it to come back around Ninety percent. Turn it up just a little bit more. Ninety four, ninety five, ninety six. I fell. All the fans are definitely running. I know it's hard to hear with this. We're at ninety three percent. A little bit more. Get my heat gun out here. 96 percent 97 98 no I know you can't see that a 100 percent so let's see how things are going here so we got 81 degrees on the inverter wire here 86 degrees on that wire there going to to the inverter 89 87 85 so it's not hot 83 82 83 89 85 got around 88 degrees here 89 so we're kicking this thing in at 101 percent and we've been running it maybe a minute and the wires are not getting that hot in the 80s and low 90s so that's good i saw 92 degrees there so i think i'm gonna call this a test. As you can see that's pushing 101 as I saw it 102%. It says abnormal because it's not using the AC input right now. But we're kicking 101, 102% as you can see. There's no trip right now. Earlier there was a battery trip when I was 112, 120% over capacity. And nothing's getting hot and except the heat gun. And we are doing good. I just completed the test and I checked the heat one more time. I just want to show you guys that um, these wires, I don't know if you can, can you see that? Yeah, these wires are not getting hot at all. The 80s, stuff like this. But this one wire, that was 96. This one wire right here uh, gets up, it got hot. 106. I need to check that wire, 107. So what I need to do is probably. Uh, take that out and inspect that to see what may be causing that. Maybe something's loose, maybe connection's loose, so I definitely need to check that. Well, I guess you could call that a successful test. Um, I did find the one issue here with this wire that got warmer than the others, and that may not be a problem. I'm going to check it, make sure everything's tight, that the crimp seems good, and make sure everything's good there. 
but nothing else really got hot. It handled it very well. Uh, this feels a little bit warm, but not too bad. The fans have turned off. All these components to build this system I purchased myself. This wasn't a sponsored video. I'm going to put links below to everything here, all these different components, and some of those links will be affiliate links. Um, if you click one of those links and you purchase something, then I will get a small commission and won't cost you a penny more. I really appreciate the people that take time to comment, like the videos, and subscribe. I have more videos in the works. Um, if you're new to the channel and you've seen all my videos, check out these two videos here. And I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching.